My name is Peter Oliuk. I'm from Holland and I'm a conservation geneticist. I'm specialized in how to preserve small populations. So you can think of animals in the zoo or dog breeds like the Leonberger. I had Icelandic sheepdogs myself when I was young, a typical example of a small population. And today what I'm going to do is all that I learned during my life as a researcher and as a zoo advisor, I'm going to talk about what happens in dog breeds because dog breeds is an example where genetic diversity is lost in a very high rate. Uh, the genetic erosion, so to say, is really high. So I'm going to emphasize on that a lot and I'm also going to talk what the consequences are of such a loss of diversity. So the loss of genetic diversity is the most important threat in dog breeds and therefore we have to educate ourselves better on how to counteract on this continuous threat. I'm going to talk about what it means to have and to lose genetic diversity. And I will use the example of the Icelandic sheepdog. When we're talking about conservation, it's also important to understand what you want to conserve. So we're trying to conserve a breed and therefore we conserve breed characteristics and their origin. So we want a breed to be healthy. We want a breed to have a good type. Uh, in other words, exterior and good behavior. In this case, Leonberger should not be aggressive because it's meant to be a, a companion animal. Dog breeds are bred according to a breed standard, a kind of description on how you would like the ideal dog to look like. A breed should not only be an animal that looks in a specific way, but it should also be an animal that is originating from a specific source. And in this case for the Leonberger, it's what uh, Heinrich Essig um, selected as the original founder stock of this population. And those animals are called the founders. It's important to realize that the current population descend from these founders. So an entire population can only descend from the founder animals. Within this population there cannot be more diversity than the, the, there was in the original founders. For that matter, if you start with 100 founders, it's 10 times better than if you start with 10 founders, for example. So if we want to conserve a breed, we are looking at conserving um, the original founders as selected uh, by Heinrich Essig. And those founders had some unique genes with them. And we, our job is to, as breeders, should be to, to preserve, among others, to preserve those genes. So, we want a breed with specific characteristics. We want a breed that, is, uh, that descends from these original founders. And there's one aspect more, often forgotten, but we also want to be able to improve the breed, to be able to achieve an, uh, a better breeding goal, so to say. So dog breeds are a closed population and you have limited uh, uh, genetic material, so to say, available. And that also further puts a limit on our possibilities to keep genetic diversity. Now I'm going to present the history of the genetic diversity in the breed. And if you uh, remember from what I said before, the genetic diversity can never be higher than the diversity present in the, the founders. So if you, for example, we start here with the Icelandic sheepdog, we started with 20 founders. So in the early days, the genetic diversity of the entire breed was about 20. And as long as they all more or less breed, it would stay 20 over time. In fact, it was not the case. As you can see, the line goes down. So, while we started with about diversity of genetic diversity of 20, in, already in the beginning, there's a steep 
a decline of diversity going back to about 10. So that means that the population in those days could be restarted with about 10 unique animals and you would come up with the same genetic diversity. If you look at the Icelandic sheep today, you can see at the end of the graph that the, the number of animals, uh, if you would express the genetic diversity in number of animals, it's now about 2.5. So if you would start over, you need, would need 2.5 founders to get the diversity of the current population. So that's actually quite low. Instead of the original 20, we are kind of down now to two and a half. Here is a graph where you can see the, the population in family groups. And one family group is a group of animals that are highly related to each other, like a family. So each family group, uh, within each family group, animals are more related, and among the family groups, related is much less. And what you can see within the Icelandic sheepdog is that there is one huge family group, so animals that are all highly related to each other. But this group actually consists of different countries. In this group we can see Norway, we can see Sweden, we can see a little bit of Iceland, and we can uh, see uh, uh, Finland and Denmark. All in one family group. So the idea that a country is uh, itself a family that is not necessarily true. It might be for some breeds, but for sure not in the Icelandic sheepdog. But also in the case of the Leonberger, we know that there's not one separate group per country. Um, also here, the lines are spread over countries. And during the last decades, with all the import and export of uh, our stats or puppies, this uh, mixing between countries increased. And therefore you cannot say that there's one separate line per country anymore. The thing was that this, on paper you cannot see this. On paper you don't see that those dogs are related because the relationship is much higher in the pedigree. And I will come back to that later in this talk. In nature, almost any animal that can breed will breed. This means that in each new generation almost all the genes are mixed together and passed on. But in pedigree dog breeds it is quite a different story. Unlike in wild populations, or with endangered species in zoo populations, in the dog world, a breeder will select only a few dogs from each generation to breed from. Maybe one in ten puppies, on average, will breed. In the case of males, it is fewer still. Maybe only 5% of males will sire the next generation. This means that in each generation, there is already a dangerous downward spiral taking place and genetic diversity decreases dramatically with each successive generation. This is the opposite of the approach taken by conservationists who are trying to preserve endangered populations. Here every effort is made to breed from the maximum number of distinct individuals in each successive generation so that we may preserve as much of the overall diversity as we can and save the species. If pedigree dog breeds are also to be saved, then breeders must start to think in the same way those conservationists do. They must conserve the genetics as much as possible. So now let's focus on some zoo populations. I investigated uh, some zoo populations and I'll present here three. And you have to imagine that zoo populations started also with collecting founders, but nowadays it's very difficult to find new animals, especially for the endangered species. So the zoos kind of have to deal with the material that they have. And therefore zoos are very uh, protective towards their genetic material. And they manage their genetic diversity as, as well as they can. Um, here I'm going to present uh, three populations. This is the world population of each uh, species. So there are about more than uh, about 1,500 cheetahs in the world and all zoos in the world that are uh, bred and kept in captivity within zoos. And they represent a diversity of about 60 individuals. So their genetic diversity is, I would say, 60. Then we have the bonobo. It's this, this smaller chimp animal. 
Uh, they are only about 200 animals in, in zoos and they represent with each other about 21 individ individual, unique individuals, so to say. Uh, genetic diversity of 21. And there's the red panda, also known as the fire fox. And this animal, is, there are about 550 uh, individuals in zoos and they represent about 18 unique individuals. Genetic diversity of 18. So now that you have a kind of idea about uh, some species, now let's look at some dog breeds. Again, we are presenting here data of global populations, so all dogs are included per breed. And if you look at the Leicestershire healer, they have population more than 3,000 individuals. The genetic diversity is only five. So that's much lower than we could see in zoo populations. So while the population size is higher, we only represent five individuals. For the Iceland sheepdog, with their 2,000, now about 3,000 individuals, we represent, we have, they have a genetic diversity of only 2.4. The Toller, also known as the Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever, though the population is really high, over 25,000 individuals, those whole population only pre represents two animals in diversity. And the Wetterhoen is even lower and the Sarlo's Wolf dog, it's a Dutch breed which originates from a crossing from a German Shepherd and a wolf, is only could only be restored by one individual, almost unimaginable. So while you have a population of 800 or 2000 individuals, like with the Wetterhoen, they only represent 1.3 or 1 dog. And that is really low. So, now considering the breeding history of the Leonberger, it's a fair question to ask what is the genetic diversity within the Leonberger population at this moment? So, let me conclude what happened to the Icelandic sheepdog. So while the population size actually grew, there were more and more dogs born, the genetic diversity did not benefit at all. And it was not necessary. If the, we really, if the dogs were, were picked that were much more unrelated to the big family group, so to say, the genetic diversity would also have been increasing. Till now I've been talking about genetic diversity, but there is a strong correlation between genetic diversity and inbreeding. And in between is relatedness. So actually when you calculate genetic diversity, you do that by calculating the relatedness or the inbreeding. And therefore I'm going now to focus on inbreeding. The more genetic diversity you have, the less animals would be related to each other. And the less animals are related to each other, the less inbreeding there will be. Therefore, the inbreeding is a kind of way into looking at genetic diversity. But it's important to realize that uh, inbreeding is not the cause of the lack of genetic diversity. It's the opposite. Lack of genetic diversity creates inbreeding. So now let's focus on inbreeding a little. I'm going to show you an example of uh, an animal that is inbred to its grandfather. And if you would have to guess the inbreeding of this animal, well, it's uh, half of a full brother sister mating, which would be 25%. This is 12.5% inbreeding in this case. So what would happen, and I'm going to give you the next example, if an animal would be not inbred to its grandparents, but its great-grandparents instead. So here is Mill Y, and Mill Y is inbred to its great-grandfathers four times. So now the question to you is, is the inbreeding higher or lower than 12.5%? You would say it might be higher because it's inbred four times towards its parent. But you could also argue that the inbreeding would be lower because it's a generation back. Well, actually both are true. So, 
they cancel each other out. And the inbreeding of male I, Y is exactly the same as for female X. It's also 12.5%. Now we go to a third example. And this female Z, you can see, is actually a combination of male Y and female X. So you cannot even really say it's a half-brother sister mate any, mating anymore. But what you can see is for this animal, at every grandfather uh, end of the pedigree, it's the same male F there again. And now it will not be a surprise that the inbreeding of this animal is also 12.5%. So imagine we have two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-parents, grandparents, and if you continue to, uh, for example, uh, generation 11, there will be over 8,000 parents there. We know that the breed started with only 20 animals and that became more or less 10. So the actual inbreeding of what happens generations before adds to the inbreeding as we can see it now. And if we realize that, you understand that uh, what happened in the generation between also has an effect. So if you have a popular shire that was used a lot in the generations after the founding generation, this will also increase the inbreeding. This will accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. And that makes the inbreeding in the current population often very high. The kinship is very high and therefore the genetic diversity is very low. Out of eight puppies, only one is used and seven is last. Only 15% is actually used in breeding. Imagine the implications. So, now that you realize that the contribution of inbreeding of founder animals or popular shires is very strong on the current population, though they might be many generations back, you might also immediately realize that calculations of inbreeding should always be done, including all generations. Uh, sometimes you see calculations based on seven, eight, nine generations. In a way, they by far don't express the true inbreeding. And this is an important point to remember. I even did research on this and what I found is if you calculate inbreeding on seven, eight or nine generations, the numbers that came out are actually more or less even similar, which might you give you the fake impression that it doesn't really matter to, of, to go further in, in, in the number of pedigrees that you, and, and the number of generations that you include. But this is not true. As soon as you include all pedigrees of all generations, suddenly there might be a strong shift in the calculation of kinship and inbreeding, and therefore you might detect much more loss of genetic diversity as well. In the Leonberger breed, we are very lucky to have almost complete pedigree databases going back all the way to some of the founders themselves. This is a fantastic tool, but it also clearly shows us how vulnerable the breed's genetic diversity has now become. If you look at the average inbreeding level for all generations within the modern Leonberger, you will see a number approaching 30%. If a brother with sister breeding produces a 25% inbreeding level, you can clearly see that this means that the inbreeding levels are already very high, and that means that the genetic diversity is very low similar to the Icelandic sheepdog that we spoke about earlier, where we know that there was an original founder population of some 20 unique individuals. In the case of the Leonberger, the breed history tells us that Heinrich Essig started breeding with just a few large dogs, such as the Landseer, Newfoundland, Pyrenean Mountain Dog, and St. Bernard. 
From 1846 until 1885, he bred and sold hundreds of dogs, and most of them he called Leonbergers. But there were also other dog merchants in the town of Leonberg who did the same. There is no written account of Essex breeding program, and we have no stud book or written pedigrees of the dogs bred. The first standard for the Leonberger breed was written after Essex's death by Albert Kuhl in 1895. Other breed clubs had also produced their own standards by then, and this meant that some dogs that had previously been classified as one breed no longer fit that breed's standard. This led to a reclassification of many individual dogs. Red, yellow, and white Leonbergers became St. Bernard's. Solid yellow or red St. Bernard's, with or without a black mask, became Leonbergers. Silver gray Newfoundland dogs were reclassified into the famous silver gray Leonbergers. Any dog that resembled a Leonberger, regardless of the pedigree evidence, was suddenly considered to be a Leonberger. It is therefore nearly impossible today to accurately identify the actual founder population for the breed. A lot of the early written accounts that did exist were subsequently lost in the First World War. Following the war, when Carl Stadelmann and his friend Otto Josenhans started to recover the breed, they found dogs with few, if any, complete pedigrees. Some of these dogs, however, were more or less traceable to the known pre-war Leonbergers, and therefore Stadelmann and Josenhans managed to rebuild the Leonberger breed. The population was again reduced during World War II, causing another serious bottleneck. And until quite recently, close line breeding was very common in many regions. Taking all of this into account, one can easily understand how it is now possible to have such very high levels of inbreeding within the modern Leonberger breed. So now that I talked about how genetic diversity is lost, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what the implications are. Um, there are actually three problems with the loss of genetic diversity. And the first one is that as soon as you lose genetic diversity, it might be possible of some specific genetic disease to surface. So. Uh, we know that there are about 600 uh, genetic diseases possible in dogs and probably there are even a lot more. This is not really a rare thing because um, even in humans there are even much more diseases known, known. So the number of diseases is actually not that important. In fact, every person or dog has about five genetic diseases with them. And that's in itself not a problem, because in, in the case of human, the chance that your partner has the same genetic disease is very low, because there are about well, more than 600 of them. However, if you would marry your, your uh, niece or cousin or uh, uncle, for, t for that matter, it, it might be uh, becoming problematic, because then you might have the exact same disease that was prevalent in your grandparents, for example. So then it becomes a different story. And like I explained, with the inbreeding, uh, increase of inbreeding populations, the problem is that every animal is already more or less brother and sister, even if you don't see that on the pedigree. But the, the inbreeding in higher regions might uh, make that happen. And there we have the problem. Because of the low genetic diversity, it happens that uh, some specific genetic diseases surface. That's problem one. But there is more. Because inbreeding also has another effect and it's known as inbreeding depression. Inbreeding depression is very well known in livestock uh, animals because inbreeding depression uh, reduces fitness. And that means, for example, in, in pigs that uh, pigs uh, get less piglets or in breeds that uh, milk yield of a cow is, is lower than it could be when the animal is not inbred. So therefore in livestock breeding the level of inbreeding is very carefully monitored and taken into account in the breeding programs that they have going on. 
Another problem with inbreeding depression is that it also will give a problem with uh, immune system response because that's often uh, less uh, strong if an animal is inbred. So the more inbred an animal is, the less it can cope, so to say, with diseases that are coming from the environment, like viruses or bacteria infections. The risks of inbreeding depression are more genetic illnesses emerging because more of the faulty genes will have a chance of coming together, reduced fertility and shorter life expectancy, weaker immune systems and therefore more susceptibility to allergies, viruses, bacterial infections and cancers. A strong immune system helps prevent cancer and so a weak immune system can't do the same job and we know that we now see far too much cancer in the breed today. There's a third problem with the lack of genetic diversity. And this is a problem that is seldomly mentioned. But without genetic diversity, actually there's no way to improve your breed. As soon as you want to improve your breed, you need genetic diversities, or in other words, you need the genes to be able to do this. Without genetic diversity, a breed would look the same generation after generation after generation. But the opposite is also true. The more diversity you have in a population, the quicker you get to a breed as you like to see it. And the more diversity you have, the more easy it will be to select in favor of traits that you like. So, in other words, the more genetic diversity you have available in your gene pool, the faster you can actually also reach your specific breeding goals. So now that we've talked about what it means to have low genetic diversity and we know that within dog breeds the genetic diversity is this low, it's important to start to address what can we do about it. And fortunately, uh, zoos have tackled this problem already for a long time. And in zoos they developed a tool for this. It's called mean kinship. Let me explain first how we can, how it's even possible to increase genetic diversity because uh, there's almost no literature, for example, about this topic. And that's because most theory on genetic diversity is on, on random mating huge populations like they might exist in the wild. But dog populations are completely different from the standard populations as we know them. Because dog populations have much less ancestors, the founders, and they breed in a specific way, which can be everything called but random. It's a very structured population. So what happens, for example, if one dog contributes much more uh, to, uh, to the next generation than, for example, two others, then you can imagine that the genes represented by the two others are underrepresented. And by using those animals more in the next generation, the progeny of those animals, you kind of balance back what was skewed by using one individual uh, a lot in the first place. So indeed there is a possibility to increase genetic diversity. Popular shires are a big problem uh, in breeding today because it also means that many other dogs are not used. So rather than using one shire for many litters, it would be much better if many shires father just one or few litters. We should focus more on what I would call one-time litters, so that parents that are never used will be at least used one time. And actually this is the way, one of the most important ways, 
to make sure that genetic diversity is kept high in the population. Mean kinship is a measure that you can give for each individual dog. And this measure is a kind of a measure for the relatedness of this dog to the average of the population. An average relatedness, or in other words, mean kinship. The more an uh, animal is related towards the population, the less it would contribute to the population, because those, apparently those genes are already in the populations. So what we want is the animals that have low mean kinship, because low mean kinship means they're unrelated to the population as a whole, and they have a lot to contribute. And this contribution might increase the genetic diversity of the population as a whole. So in order to give a better perception on what mean kinship means, uh, let's start with a metaphor. And in the metaphor, uh, picture yourself a population where in the middle there's a high concentration of highly related animals, while at the rim we have more unrelated animals. And if we would keep on focusing on those highly related animals, what's at the rim would fall off. So what we need to do is put those animals at the rim more in the middle, start to breed with those animals as well, so that their contribution will also be represented in next generations and the genetic diversity will keep on being high. Mean kinship is not the same as the coefficient of inbreeding. Coefficient of inbreeding tells you how likely it is that an individual will inherit identical copies of the same gene from both the mother and the father. Mean kinship tells you whether an individual will contribute genes that are already commonly found within the population, or instead, if they can give a more valuable contribution because the genes that they carry are less common. So, in order to calculate these mean kinships, it's important to have good pedigree data. That's the way how we can deal with it. And um, this pedigree data is, is uh, we have to get in, in, in three steps. The first step is to assemble everything in one data set. We, we have to connect, for example, for some uh, breeds, we have to connect the data set of France, Germany, Iceland, of Scandinavia as a country, for example, in the case of the Icelandic dog, into one data set, so we can find all connections of all current population towards the founder generation. And this is very important, uh, because we know founders and their uh, offspring might already have a huge impact on the outcome of the, of the entire inbreeding level and the genetic diversity of the entire breed. And fortunately, the Leyenberger is in a situation that they do have the, the, this data set, then the next step should be done. The next step is to identify all the, so to say, orphans, the, the animals from which we don't know uh, what the parents were. And those are in two categories. We already talked about founders. Often their parents are not known. This is not a problem. The problem lies in the animals that we don't know the parents of, but we know they descend from one of these founders or their progeny. Because if you don't correct for that, they might think those are founders as well. And this has a significant impact of the uh, entire um, calculation of mean kinship. And you might favor animals with, mean kin with low mean kinship animals that actually not have a mean kinship, only look unrelated because we don't know the parents. So that's step two, we identify the parents. So with a good data set, the last step is simply perform the calculation that is needed. And if that is done, then we can make a list of the entire population as we have it now, with mean kinship connected to each individual dog. And you should not see this too much as a black and white thing, but more like a, uh, animals that are in the green zone, animals that are in the yellow zone, and animals that are in the red zone. Animals that are in the red zone, having high mean kinships, they should be used less uh, or not at all if you have the chance. Animals in the yellow zone, 
well, preferably the green ones, but still okay. And then the green animals are really should be favored in, in breeding programs or when, for example, you know an animal, uh, a puppy is going to a breeder. And when you apply this system, you can, like zoos, keep the genetic diversity relatively high or sometimes even improve diversity as I explained just now. And in this way we can prevent these problems like the diseases that are prevalent in so many breeds, uh, Bernese mountain dogs that where half of the population die from cancer as soon as they uh, reach the age or more or less five. Um, these shocking numbers are all to do with this depletion of genetic diversity. And to avoid this we have a great tool and if we apply that um, at least we can not only make sure we get rid of diseases, but we also have the opportunity to increase or um, go in the direction with the breed that you want in a faster, effective way. So we know that the genetic diversity is decreasing and we know now the problems in many breeds. And for many breeds there is no other option than to start crossbreeding. If you want to avoid this for the Leonberger, it's important to take into account these kind of measures. Use more animals, don't throw away 80% of the population anymore. And incorporate maybe mean kinship into breeding. In that way, you will have the tools to improve the genetic diversity and therefore the Leonberger also in the, in the future. Thank you very much for your attention.